welcome to Slavery and Its Legacies, a podcast of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. Slavery and Its Legacies interviews visiting scholars, activists, and others about their contributions to the understanding of slavery, past and present, and its ongoing role in the development of the modern world. Hello, this is Thomas Thurston, and today I'm talking with Rachel Stevens, who's an associate professor of art history at the University of Alabama and a Gilder Lehrman Center spring four-month fellow. Her first book, Selling Andrew Jackson, Ralph E. W. Earl and the Politics of Portraiture, was released in June 2018 from the University of South Carolina Press. She holds degrees in art history from Swanee and Vanderbilt, as well as a PhD from the University of Iowa. Her research focuses on 19th century American art, particularly in the South. Last semester, she was a Tyson Fellow at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. And she'll be speaking here about her current book project, which uh, investigates the implications of suppression on pro-South visual culture. It's really great having you here. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I've heard a lot about your project, but it's nice uh, to be able to have the chance uh, to share it with a larger audience. Uh, but let's begin. You're, you're talking about Southern art and antebellum, mostly? Yeah, I've narrowed the project specifically to the years 1830 to 1860. There, uh, obviously, I could take it much farther um, forward in time or back in time, but to hit specifically on that antebellum era is where I found um, sort of the richest visual culture, and so that's my that's my period. So how did you uh, uh, come to this uh, this ki- kind of uh, from starting as someone obviously who's interested in art history? Is that kind of where you began your did your interest develop early, or did you kind of stumble into this? That's a great question. I've been interested in American art from the beginning of my study of art history back in my undergraduate days, but didn't really get any introduction, perhaps surprisingly, um, to Southern art until very late in my studies. It was actually late in my coursework for my PhD program that I really began to consider Southern art as a separate discipline. And I say surprisingly because I went to college and did a master's degree in the South. Right. And... um, Southern art just does not tend to be part of the canon of American art. So in a standard undergraduate or even graduate class on American art, often its um, approach is taken from a northeastern angle. Right. And it actually was, like I said, very late in my studies when I saw an article that was sort of formative for me. It was by a scholar named Maury McGinnis, and she wrote this, what might be called a state of the field article uh-huh. on Southern art specifically. It's called Little of Artistic Merit, the Promise, the Problem, excuse me, and Promise of uh, Southern American Art. And published in 2006, it really, for the first time, forced me to think critically about Southern art and why it hasn't been studied. Right. And um, that actually inspired my dissertation and then subsequent first book project about a Southern portraitist named Ralph E.W. Earle, uh-huh. who is best known for painting Andrew Jackson. Is this the class, the one we all kind of know and, and have mixed feelings about? The portrait of yeah, Andrew the, Jackson? Yeah, is that the... The Earl did paint, if you're speaking of the portrait in the White House right. currently. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> that was the one I was, had on my mind. Earl did paint that. He oh, painted wow. dozens of portraits oh, of Andrew Jackson. So he was just knocking them out. Oh, yeah. He was kind of his official portraitist huh. and right-hand man, actually. Uh, but uh, it was thinking, it was actually in that thinking about Earl's work for Jackson and Earl's visual work for Jackson, that I really first began thinking about the visual culture of slavery. Right. Because I had been studying for years at that point images of Andrew Jackson and was aware of him as a slave owner and um, 
a member of the planter elite in the South, and yet very rarely did I see even reference to his enslaved people in the records and documents associated with Earl and, and Jackson. And even more rarely did I see enslaved people pictured. Right, right. And I, you know, when I think about um, uh, enslaved people in antebellum art, it's, it's the work of abolitionists and, uh, and, and that, that kind of visual uh, uh, work, which, of course, presents, um, you know, slavery uh, uh, in, you know, in the harsh light that you would expect it to. Uh, but you're right. I can't, I, I don't think much about uh, the place of enslaved people in Southern art or, as you said, honestly, Southern art at all. Yeah, and there are very particular reasons that it's not in your consciousness. Right. And partly that's because the abolitionists were much more well-organized, direct, and ambitious with producing visual culture that aligned with their message. Sure. So there is probably, although there's never been an exact study on this, a, a greater quantity of images that came out of the abolitionist movement. But that has led people to believing that there's actually not a lot of visual culture that came out of anti-abolition or pro-slavery. Right. And that actually isn't the case at all. And so that's what really intrigued me and gave me sort of an entry point into looking at this is thinking about where these images are, what their message is, and why don't we know about them? I mean, th you would think that I mean, I can kind of understand that. It's, it's like pro-slavery art is not the sort of thing that you would expect or want uh, to see in a public museum in Atlanta or something like that. And it does kind of beg the question is, is it how on earth, where, what, when you speak of that sort of art, what do, you really, what do you really mean by it? How do you identify it as opposed to some kind of generic kind of Southern art? Uh, and, and also, like, like, where is it? Yeah, these are really good questions, and it is a really difficult um, job at peeling back the motivations for the works, um, whether or not they were specifically intended to, say, counteract what the abolitionists were doing, or whether they were, you know, say more innocently, if you can say that, made to hang in the home of a planter. So it's a it's a difficult job to get at these, and... Um, I would say in line with that, it's also difficult to find them right. because they haven't been privileged in in art history or in museums. And so it's it's tracking them down and figuring out the motivations of the person that commissioned them, of the artist, and then getting into reception and how they were viewed and seen at the period that makes it a really complicated picture. And then also, you're right that it might be they're very painful images. Right. So they're racist and they're 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 painful, and it's not necessarily easy to ex for all institutions to exhibit them. Right. And so there's it's a complicated story. So sure. they're they're in the back. They're in the back. They're in someone's private collection, or or and likely up in the attic or something like that. So. Uh, so tell me a little about your research method in that case. <laughs> yeah, it's been sort of a scavenger hunt, hunt and peck, roundabout sort of project or, or project at getting at this. And I didn't know exactly how to approach it, especially because, as you say, many of the images that I'm looking at aren't the ones that are out front and center right. in the museum collections. In fact, I've had to make multiple appointments at multiple different institutions to get with the curator, to get into the storage, to see the image that I right. want to look at. And that's a story in and of itself. But in terms of how I've done it, um, like I said, I didn't really I didn't really know how to approach it. So I began by seeking research funding. So I sought research funding at places I believed would have things that related to pro-slavery art, but also in line with that, the written records. Right. I, I felt like it was very important to align the visual image as much as I could with the written word. Very rarely does it align so neatly as you might have 
specific letters and diary entries about a specific work of art. But if you can read and think about um, diaries and letters of plantation owners and slave owners and also... Um, do you have records from, say, the artists themselves or any kind of, like, documentary collections from them? Sometimes. Uh -huh. I will say that archival records for a Southern artist are, are difficult right. and often non-existent for a lot of reasons. A, because the subject matter hasn't been privileged, and B, because a lot of them, like you say, were contained in private hands and have disappeared over the years or been destroyed by weather or or sure. whatever. Yeah. And so um, my process involved, like I said, seeking funding at institutions. So I had an extended period at the Virginia Historical Society. I had an extended period at the Filson Historical Society, yeah. Library of Congress, places I knew that had strong collections in Southern material. And um, going there, being on the ground and speaking with the people that knew the collections most intimately about my project and having their expertise guide me to different directions that I might go in, that was the starting point. And that was really invaluable. Sure. And then... Those people are all for oh any research gosh. project. Oh, my gosh. I, uh, we, and by we, I mean researchers. Yeah, of course. Could, we would be lost without these right. ex field experts. And and that so that's been invaluable. And then it seems like any surface you scratch at or any any direction I'm I'm um, led toward opens up a variety of new directions. Right. So it's kind of been this this navigational path and in locating things that I felt were ultimately relevant to the story I decided to tell. And have you been how long has it been like like three or four years that you've been on this quest? I have um, pretty much full time uh, full time every summer for the past three summers probably. And because the during the academic school year, it's there's not as much time outside. You're not of running teaching around Tuscaloosa and checking out the little <laughs> the home museums. A little bit as much as I can, but really my directed efforts are in the summers. And then I've had this uh -huh. really wonderful year this year where I've had these two fellowships and I've been able to sit down and really focus and and begin to piece the story together. So so right now. Um, like how? Give me a sense of of what you've found as far as just like broad numbers. Like how many how many works of art do you kind of put in this? You're looking like, I, or you know how many uh, how many artists do you are you finding artists that 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 seem to be just going from from plantation to plantation and 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 painting you know you know idyllic scenes or whatever or how you know what does uh, your uh, What's your, what's your research uncovered just in kind of the, the amount of material you're able to work with? Well, there's actually a surprisingly large amount of material. Hmm. I have and would like to include many more images than ultimately I will probably be able to include in a book-length study. And um, this that's partially because I'm looking at photographs, prints, and paintings. So in terms of print culture... That's where we see the largest numbers of images. Quite frankly, they were less expensive to produce, quicker um, to produce, and then easier to disseminate among a broad, broad audience. So people that felt very strongly about their message and were working in what we maybe would call propagandistic ways right. were turning to print culture. And so I'm overwhelmed with the prints. Mm -hmm. And same thing with photographs. There are potentially hundreds of photographs that could be included in a study of pro-South visual culture. The um, sort of type or case study that I've narrowed it down to are those photographs that most of us are really well aware of that depict enslaved what were known as mammies with the white children right, of their sure. owners. Yeah. And I see those as pro-slavery icons because they were – visually available in the plantation homes. So uh, visible by lots of people and making a specific case for enslaved people as part of the family, right. a familial environment. And that's something that um, 
rhetoricians or pro-slavery advocates spoke of again right. and again. And so here's the yeah. visual. It normalizes slavery. It's just exactly. part, part of the family. It, exactly. And that was one of the primary goals of this visual culture. Mm. And so then the paintings, there's far fewer numbers in terms of paintings. And they're a little harder to get at because p- paintings tend to be a lot more subtle than yeah. prints sure. for, for maybe obvious reasons. But... I'm overwhelmed with material, and so part of it has been a winnowing process to figure out what is not only representative of the work that was produced, but also what tells the specific story that that I'm trying to tell, and what how I've ultimately narrowed that down is um, it's a it's a wide ranging study about pro slavery visual culture, but with with themes. Um, it by its nature, I really feel strongly that it needs to be sort of a survey just because there's very little literature yeah. on this area. Yeah. But then I really want to give it some depth to really um, tell a fully fleshed out story. So in some cases, it's broad. And in other other cases, I kind of go deeply and in, as deeply into the story as the, the records allow me to. Um, so there's been recent work on on 18th century British art. Uh, that depict uh, enslaved people in them. And uh, it seems kind of as a rule that these portraits are a way of displaying one's standing and wealth, right? So that and you have all the things that are signifiers of that, including like a young enslaved servant, you know? Is, is there anything, is that kind of, is there anything at all like that? Or, or are you talking about, in some ways, you're displaying the display of slavery is more subtle. I think that certainly is is applicable here. And there are lots and lots of examples of Southerners using art to show their standing, whether it be their wealth, their um, top of the racial hierarchy, that kind of thing. But I ultimately became more interested in thinking about the ways that the visual production aligned with the pro-slavery arguments. And so that certainly could be part of it if we're thinking about that family black and white idea or if we're thinking about the normalization of slavery. But I turned less towards examples like that and more towards examples that showed perhaps happy, carefree, and healthy enslaved people Mm. playing on their plantation, which we see again and again as well. Yeah, but back to the British thing, I will say that, and only recently have I started thinking more globally about how those images from Britain, even the 18th century images, and there weren't as many then as there were in the 1830s, but in the 1780s and 90s, there was abolitionist print culture. We're all familiar with the Wedgwood supplicant right, of course. slave, for example, emerging out of Britain and coming to the United States. And so we know about the abolitionist work that was was um, along those lines. But pro-slavery and anti-abolitionist work, too, was coming out of Britain in the eight, eight, 1780s and 90s huh. and, and circulating around the Atlantic and in the United States. So that period's a little bit outside the scope of my project. Sure. But that's just to say that these were global issues and global ideas that Americans on both sides of the slave, slave debate were really looking to the British precedent and um, we aren't in in this st- field of study as aware of that happening on the pro slavery side as well, and it certainly does. Yeah, that's certainly true. I uh, this uh, I, I, I you know uh, with the work of abolitionists, there's just so many images uh, that just come to mind without even giving much thought to the subject. But on the on the the counter side, I it's I'm hard pressed, and uh, and so. So if you could kind of so you talk a lot about uh, is is do you see this mainly in say lens is this landscape portrait or is uh, are these depictions of of the plantation house and all that uh, the kind of the wealth and and standing that that I mean is that where you find uh, your kind of strongest kind of pro slavery arguments or. Well, like I said, the paintings tend to be more subtle, but uh-huh. they are equally intriguing. 
it tends to be harder to get out the exact message of a painting because uh, painters were often less staunchly political, at least overtly, than printmakers Mm -hmm. per se. Sure. Because they were trying to make a living, they were often willing to produce images for those on both sides of the slavery argument. But there certainly are lots of examples in the South of beautiful romanticized vistas or estate portraits, as John Michael Blatch has called them, that put the big house right in the center, the family happily splayed out in various ways across the estate, and often very small images also within those of enslaved people, maybe as a a status marker, as you mentioned earlier. Uh And so those definitely I see room for inclusion because I do see those as a justification of the order of things in the South. But then, they're, like I said, the prints are much more incendiary and overt. And I see a place for some of the prints as well because, like I said, I'm really interested in how the art responded to or aligned with the rhetoric. Yeah. I'm also equally interested in and have found that the art is directly responding to abolitionist visual culture. So we can't really, I think, understand the pro-slavery side if we don't know what they're responding to. And they weren't using visual culture to the extreme that abolitionists were until the abolitionists became so convincing at it and so kind of kind of directive with it. So I've found examples again and again of Southern works that are in direct response to abolitionist works and, in fact, using the same types of scenes but flipping them on their heads. Give me, give me an example of one, just and for our, our, our listeners. Uh, uh, so paint us or, <laughs> or, or, or sketch us, uh, uh, lithograph us, a, <laughs> you know, a, a picture of, what, uh, of, of the sort of thing you're talking about uh, and, and where you find them. Okay, sure. So probably most listeners can conjure up these truly horrific images of violence that was um, enacted against enslaved people and visualized by abolitionist visual culture. This could be scenes of whipping or mothers, families being torn apart, that kind of thing. So in response to that, pro-slavery uh, visual culture would show that slavery actually did no violence, that their, their, um, their, that this wasn't an actually actually an inherent part of the everyday life of an enslaved person, and they do that by showing the opposite of of um, violent acts. Be that happy fa- happy and ensla- happily enslaved families playing together, or um, kind of like a healthy happy environment on the plantation. So it's counter kind of the family that slavery tears families apart and the auction block scene, instead they'll show, you know, the the humble but cozy slave cabin uh, with the nuclear family all there. Yeah, exactly. That and um, also, also sort of retelling the idea that, as I've mentioned, slavery sort of all in the family. Like everyone on the plantation right. is, is, is a family unit together. And we see that phrase in the correspondence again and again, family black and white. And yeah, the, the visual culture really, really substantiates all of these ideas. So everything you've been talking about is uh, really fascinating, uh, and it's great to kind of get examples. But how do you kind of construct an, uh, an argument uh, out, of, out of this? What's, what is the kind of argument that you think kind of is holding your work together? Ultimately, again and again, as I was putting all the research together and sort of learning about what was out there, I was seeing the concept of cover-up or concealment or suppression emerging again and again. And I thought that that might be a good umbrella way to categorize all these, you know, various competing ideas of what I was seeing. So in the, the largest sense, uh, in terms of concealment, I see the justification of slavery, which, of course, pro-slavery 
politicians were pronouncing and then the visual culture was also speaking to um, ways that slavery just wasn't as bad as the abolitionists were making it out to be. So in justifying slavery, they're making it look good in the ways I've described, and that is a cover-up to me. Right. And in the same way, um, in doing that, they're also concealing the reality of slavery, the nature of the humanity of the enslaved person. There's a lot of concealment there. Yeah. But then in other really interesting ways, concealment plays out, whether that be um, in artists that were working in secret ways. The best example of this is is a German printmaker in Baltimore working during the Civil War named Volk, Adalbert Volk, who everything about the way he was maneuvering, he did so in secret. And that's because his work was so incendiary that he was afraid of being arrested by the Union who was in control of Maryland at the time. And so he wrote under a pseudonym. He was smuggling his works to England. He uh, printed and selected and, and took subscribers in by, in complete anonymity. Um, so, and what kind of images are what are they like that that he's producing? They are both an attack on abolitionists. So he's completely belittling abolitionist leaders, particularly Benjamin Butler, who was in Baltimore at the time uh-huh. that he was doing this, and Abraham Lincoln and many others. So he's belittling them and casting them in all these different sorts of variety of, of ridiculous ways. Almost like a cartoonist might absolutely a cartoonist in a way. Yeah, exactly. He's also at the same time showing sympathy for the South um, and enslaved people and making Union troops out to be vicious killers. So he's uh, he's approaching it from all these different sides in being completely supportive of the Confederacy and its efforts and at the same time making um, slaves seem loyal and and familial again. So so there's there's artists and he's he's my case study for the ways that these ideas were coming out kind of secretly, and that's also a form of cover up. But then there's also lots and lots of destruction of abolitionist art, of abolitionist m- motives and actions, and we see that play out in the visual culture as well. So I also look at destruction and violence and the ways that is exhibited in visual culture as another form of cover up or concealment. Hmm. And so so the overall overarching trend of concealment, I think, allowed allows me to get at various angles of this pro-South movement and to address all these different media. But then also by necessity, I think, think about consider how they're responding to the abolitionist work. So the abolitionist work is 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 material that's much more commonly seen. Right. So if we see that, then it might be really easy to understand what that inspired. And that inspired this backlash that I think it's really important for us to know about as well. For the period, what what happens? I mean, do you see kind of a shift as, you know, as the war approaches and then you're covering right through the war? I mean, what is happening to the art in the way that uh, that uh, the artists uh, and I guess our patrons are kind of like seeing their position uh, relative to slavery? The pro-slavery supporters seem to get more and more committed to justification over the decades leading up to the war and more and more committed to its maintenance. In terms of the visual art, that plays out in really what seems today like just overtly sweet images of slavery. Hmm. Now, between 1830 and 1860, there's not a huge shift, though. And it's really the visual culture really doesn't start to come into its own until that 1830 point. I don't see a lot of this type of stuff before 1830. And that's about the point when the positive good, slavery is a positive right. good rather than a necessary evil idea starts playing out. And so that justification that I sort of see as undergirding all of this starts about 1830. And so so that's really specifically why I've chosen this period is because it's 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 a discrete period in which lots of justification was occurring and getting more strident as we move toward war. That's really interesting because um, in some ways, what you're talking about reminds me very much of the kind of lost cause 
nostalgia about you know the the you know the slavery and how it was you know how paternalistic it was and that and it's like so you have this lost cause you could almost argue that the lost cause ideology is like starting like decades before the end of slavery that they're already kind of uh pushing at the kind of nostalgic picture of the happy plantation absolutely and that is ultimately the story i want to tell sure. because it i would love to draw a through line past 1865 with this work and show how, well, post-Reconstruction particularly, but all the way through the Jim Crow era and up until civil rights, we see this type of thing um, just just being played out again and again in very similar ways. And so all of that lost cause, romantic nostalgia – is direct comes directly out of these pre-civil war works uh, and and leads us into you know gone with the wind or or whatever sure, yeah but it's it's a story that it's a much bigger story than i'm really able to tell in right. my project and there has been a lot more study of that post bellum work right exactly but it didn't just spring from nowhere right it's not a result of of the the uh, 13th amendment it's, exactly it's, it's something that's been brewing uh, ever since the positive good argument, you might say. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, boy, if you don't mind me asking, I know that you are off on uh, an incredible adventure this summer visiting how many plantations? <laughs> I currently have a list of 34 uh, spread all down the eastern seaboard and, and into Louisiana and Mississippi. But... It, it's a separate but really related project. Oh, okay. And, but what this little trip will allow me to do is to get inside some of these homes and, and continue to look at, 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 find places where the types of visual culture and paintings and prints that I'm looking for might reside right. that you might not see otherwise. But more than anything, I'm I'm interested in the ways that sites of slavery – and op- open to the public house museums about th- that feature that still have remnants of slavery are being presented to the public. Right. So I'm taking a tour, uh, anonymously, pu- public tours. Uh-huh. Of... Are we going to wear dark glasses or something? <laughs> I don't think anyone will <laughs> <laughs> know the better, but um, except if they see me maybe taking notes in the yeah, corner okay. of the don't tour. Do that. But I, I'm just going to visit all these various places and see how slavery is being represented to the public today. Right. I I am I was directly inspired to do this project by an article that I read and that I teach to my students and again and again and that they always love by Barbara Mooney, who's an architectural historian, and it's called Looking for History's Huts. And she did hmm. this tour. It's her brainchild. Uh-huh. But she took this tour in 2003, somewhere around around there, and found both places where slavery was really being thoughtfully considered and other places where it was either completely ignored or even being desecrated in various ways. Right, right. So she considered the ways that museums might do it better or differently and also just sort of surveyed the land. So it's been 15 years. We have a different cultural climate now than we did then. And so I'm really curious to go back to the places that she right. went to see how slavery is being presented now, 15 yeah. years on. So I have already started. I did some over the winter holiday, and I'm seeing what you might expect you might see, although it's still a work in progress. But some places have certainly completely evolved the story. Right. And right. other places have not changed one bit. So it's it's going to be very interesting, especially as I go to better known places like Monticello and right. Montpelier and places like that. Um, but I'm excited to hit the road. Um, well, we're going to be sorry that you hit the road because it's been great having you here for uh, the semester. And um, and I guess before you go, if there's anything that you could uh, share with uh, with listeners who might be interested in finding out more about. Uh, um, uh, Southern art about about the kind of issues that your work is 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 centered on. Sure, thank you. It's been a wonderful time here. Everyone at the Gilder Lehrman Center has just been so generous and kind with me. I've really enjoyed it so much. There are a few key sources that I turn to that I think would be very interesting to people. 
a book that I have always at my side is by Maury McGinnis, hmm. she, who, who's the one that wrote the little right. artistic article, uh, merit article that I mentioned. But in her 2011 book, Slaves Waiting for Sale, Abolitionist Art and the American Slave Trade, is a really wonderful survey of of abolitionist art. She identifies the three themes of abolitionist art in it. She says primarily, as I sort of alluded to earlier, we see separation of families, we see violence against enslaved people, floggings, whippings, etc. Yeah. And we see representations of the auction as kind of the three. And so she she really identifies those and breaks those down and also informs us about this incredible abolitionist artist, Air Crow, and she tells his story in Richmond. So that's a great reader and kind of entree into the visual study of slavery. There's much less material available, as I mentioned, about yeah, right. this specific idea in terms of the South. But one of the most inspirational articles I've read recently on this topic is by Jennifer Van Horn. It's called The Dark Iconoclast, and it's in the Art Bulletin put out in 2017. And she's looking at the ways that enslaved people in the Civil War era engaged with the visual art that was on the plantation, and they did it in shocking and really incredible ways. And so that, to me, was a very inspirational study, and yeah. I think people would enjoy reading it. And Professor Rachel Stevens, it has been really wonderful talking to you and, again, having you here at the Gilder Lerman Center. Thank you, Tom. I've enjoyed it. As always, the Gilder Lerman Center welcomes contributions from those who support our work and mission. To give, please go to glc.yale.edu and click on donate or email the Gilder Lerman Center for more information.